Okay, so it looks like we have uh, 21 of our favorite people who are attending CAGONT online, including our speaker. So welcome uh, everyone to uh, geographies uh, of academic work and of course the ongoing COVID-19 pandemic. This is the last session of CAGONT. I'm sure it's been an excellent experience in as much as an online conference can be uh, for, for everyone, it certainly has been for me. We have uh, four uh, excellent speakers who are gonna uh, share their experiences and insights into uh, the current status and future of work in academia uh, in light of the COVID-19 pandemic. Before I go any further, if anyone is having any issues uh, with Zoom at all, and it might help you with your experience to see our speakers, our panelists in spotlight, uh, you might use uh, the um, gray bar below the screen within feed loop that says experiencing issues, question mark, click here for additional live stream options. And that will get you to join this Zoom stream within your Zoom client rather than having to join via uh, feed loop. Okay, the session is being recorded, just FYI, so everyone is aware of that. Uh, and you are therefore from now and forevermore immortalized in, in this moment. Uh, my thanks to everyone who's uh, been organizing CAGOT. I think it's uh, at least from a, a relative outsider's perspective, I've been a little involved, but not very much. Um, it's gone very, very smoothly, and I'm sure that's because there's a lot of heavy lifting in the background. So thanks to everyone who's been involved uh, in, in doing that. Okay, COVID-19 and the geographies of academic work. As I mentioned, we've got uh, four speakers lined up for us uh, today. Uh, they are where, uh, Wayne Forsyth uh, from Ryerson University, Ben Clar, who's a graduate student uh, in the Department of Geography and Environment here at Western, Vivian Kong, who was a graduate student in Geography and Environment, and Ebenezer, who is uh, a doctoral student uh, also in Geography and Environment. And um, as I turn to the panelists to uh, make their remarks, um, they'll introduce themselves and might just remember to say a word or two about what it is that they're bringing to the panel uh, and why I've asked them to join. Um, they each come with different perspectives and will each uh, give us about uh, five or six or seven minutes of their own experiences in insights and maybe even take out their crystal balls and tell us what the future is going to look like in terms of academic work. And then uh, that'll get us to about the half hour mark and that'll leave us about 30 minutes for question and answer to wrap up this session and to wrap up Kangont 2021. So without further ado, I will uh, turn it over to um, Wayne Forsyth to open the segment. Okay, uh, thank you, Michael. Um, I was asked, asked, excuse me, I was asked to be part of this panel about six weeks ago, I think, and the perspective that I'm apparently going to bring is that of a experienced uh, leader and a little bit further uh, with respect to that is I'm a full professor in the Department of Geography and Environmental Studies at Ryerson University. And I think when I look at uh, who the other panelists are today, I probably have a lot more experience in a university type environment. Before I became a professor, I studied for 13 years. So I've been around a university environment for a long, long time. People often ask me, what do you do? And I always say, well, I'm a geographer. When I think about, okay, what kind of geographer that I am? Well, technically I think I was trained as a physical geographer, but over the years I've come to sort of embrace many different aspects of geography. And so I just refer to myself as a geographer. The other thing that you may find interesting about me is that I'm a three-time Kagon president, and as of about an hour and a half ago, I'm also a three-time former past president. So my service to Kagon has come to an end after about 13 years, and I encourage everyone to get involved with service activities. It's a very, very important part of the discipline, uh, whether COVID is around or not. So. Um, try and do some service if you can to help the discipline of geography. 
So one of the things uh, when we were discussing my participation in this panel that uh, we referred to was a document that I was very unaware of, and that's the Future of Work document that has been released by Ryerson University, which talks about the future of being a hybrid university. And I've selected a couple of quotes from the Future of Work document at Ryerson, which I've actually read to completion. And I found a couple of them quite interesting. And the quotes that I'm actually have here uh, brought some questions about, uh, from my perspective anyway. And you can see, everyone can read uh, what's on the screen here, that uh, there's a mention of momentum and there's a mention of traditional models and there's a mention of lessons learned about what we're doing. And I kind of disagree with the whole sort of idea of what momentum have we built. We've been sort of in an online learning environment for over a year and a half now. And for me, it's kind of like time is just dragging on when I'm teaching classes online, time really kind of seems to stand still. And I really miss the perspective of uh, teaching in the classroom, being in front of the class, having interaction with students. And so I kind of question what the momentum is that they're talking about and who's actually experiencing this momentum because I don't think I'm one of those people. In addition, if I consider what lessons that we're talking about, the lesson that I learned is that I really miss being in an actual classroom. And so if I think about lessons that have actually been learned with respect to becoming a hybrid university, I'm kind of puzzled as to what kind of lessons that the future work document is actually referring to and who learned these lessons. And especially important for me is what groups are we talking about and who was consulted about these lessons that are learned. So that's a couple of the questions that I've sort of thought about as I was going through this sort of hybrid university document. The next point is related to retail geography. And if you read the second quote that I've uh, created, they're cultivating improvements in employee experiences and all of that kind of things. And my point with that is location is always very, very important. And for me, you need to be in a classroom for really good teaching to occur. So of course, in the online environment, we're all doing the best that we can, but I can hardly wait to get back into a classroom. And if we're talking about improvements that have come around during this time of COVID, I'm really wondering, well, what kind of improvements are we talking about? From an employee perspective, from a professor perspective, I really want to get back into the classroom, but COVID first has to allow going back into the classroom safely, which is one of the concerns that I have. A couple of other quotes that uh, I've taken from the Future of Work document is they talk about the success that they've had in this Future of Work sort of idea and what kind of things that are going along the way and what lessons have been learned. And my question for the administrators of Ryerson, administrators in general who are thinking about this whole future of work sort of idea is how do we measure the success of what's going on as a result of COVID coming around? And what sort of flexible models can we develop and who are the flexible models going to apply to? So for example, I don't want to uh, continue teaching online for longer than I have to or longer than is required. And I definitely don't want the flexibility to have either online or in person because I think in-person learning is the best type of learning that is available. And that's not only uh, from my own experience. I happen to be the parent of a second year university student uh, right now who had online first year and that was not a good experience. Uh, and part of the reason for that is that there was a lack of interaction with students uh, I know for a fact that in courses, at least at Ryerson, and I assume at other universities, that WhatsApp groups are set up. Um, and those are no substitute for interacting with your peers in a sort of one-on-one -on -one or in a group environment when you're actually present in a location. And I think it inhibits collaboration opportunities for students when online learning is occurring. And so from my perspective, that's really kind of the number one priority that I can think about. 
Uh, one more point about this particular slide is there has been one success for me in terms of uh, this whole online thing. And, and that is, and I'm not joking here, is that we've had our departmental council and faculty meetings go online now. And I found that the participation rate is much higher and we seem to get a lot more things done in terms of having the meetings online rather than actually meeting in person. And I don't actually know why that's actually happening, but that's sort of one sort of success that I can report uh, from that experience so far to date. The final slide that I have uh, talks about a couple of the questions that were posed to all of the panelists that we have today. And that relates to how is sort of how have things evolved as a result of the COVID-19 pandemic is teaching changed forever. And I want to specifically address the teaching aspect first. So we have sort of the three options of online learning, which I'm still doing right now. I know some people are actually in person in the classroom. And when circumstances permit them, I want to get back into the classroom. And then there's this third option of hybrid learning which I think is one of the worst options ever for student learning because you disadvantage not only the people who are in the classroom with you, but you disadvantage those online as well because you cannot do both things at the same time. So I think this thought that hybrid learning is the new way to go, for me at least, that's definitely not the way to go and I, I don't want to actually go there. A little bit about research because I see I'm running out of time is, Research so far has actually been quite okay. I supervised three graduate students last year, one of them who was actually listening to this session. Hi, Vera. And two of them I knew previously from in-person interactions because they were undergraduate students at Ryerson. Vera, my graduate student who I still have, I've never actually met her in person. We've had a lot of chats on Zoom. So as far as the research goes, it's sort of worked so far and I've actually managed to publish so far one paper with an undergraduate student because she was doing a remote sensing project and remote sensing, of course, it's inherently remote. And so that has actually worked out pretty well. Uh, finally, what does teaching look like in the future? Well, I hope we can all get back to an in-person classroom experience as safely as soon as possible. And I think I'm out of time, so I will leave it at there. And I'm very interested in hearing the perspectives of the other three panelists today. Thanks. So thank you, Wayne, and, and for uh, also sharing uh, what it is that your institution is doing and the uh, positions you've held. And, and by the way, thank you, incidentally, for your 13 years of service. I'm sure it's gone by just like that, uh, because time flies when you're having fun. But thank you on all fronts. Uh, we will um, move on to Ben, where I suspect we might start to hear a bit of uh, contrarian perspective, but who knows, we'll see. I'm not gonna preempt it. So over to Ben Clark. Hi, uh, thanks. And yeah, yes, there are definitely some, uh, some points that I would be happy to, uh, to address specifically, but for now, I'll just start by uh, going over uh, some points that I was thinking of. Um, so just to introduce myself, uh, I'm a master's student at Western University, and my research focuses on human mobility and specifically how COVID has impacted local mobility patterns in Ontario. Uh, so if, I think there are a few perspectives we can use to think about the future of academic work as geographers. And uh, the three main perspectives I uh, have been thinking about and want to focus on are uh, physical and virtual interconnectedness, um, the idea of choice and flexibility, and uh, the multidisciplinary nature of geography. Um, so to start off, uh, how COVID uh, affects human interconnectedness and what that means for geography. Um, so uh, viruses like COVID aren't inherently geographic, but it does have uh, geographic impl implications related to what we do to manage it, obviously. Uh, we, one thing COVID has shown us from a geographic perspective is how physically interconnected our world still is, despite technology allowing for virtual interconnectedness. Um, for certain parts of our lives that can take place online, like uh, social activities or work or school during COVID, uh, geographic uh, proximity might become less important. 
but we can see from the pandemic that physical proximity is still an important factor in geography, just based on uh, how the virus was able to, sp to spread around the world. Um, so in terms of some of the questions we try to answer in geography or as it relates to human interconnectedness, and particularly as there has been talk about the internet and online communication platforms, uh, kind of diminishing the importance of physical proximity. Um, I think we can now see that for physical proximity is still an important factor in how people interact. Um, uh, my second uh, main point and perspective I, I want to talk about is uh, the concept of choice and flexibility. And it's something we talk about in, in uh, mobility and transportation research a lot, but just the idea of choice being that people should be able to choose an option that works best for their unique circumstances. Uh, and you can do this by ensuring that different options are accessible so that that choice is available. Um, in transportation research, that option often refers to travel mode, like uh, walking, cycling, public transit, driving. Um, and assuming that these options are relatively equally available to someone, they will choose the mode that may, that works best uh, for their particular trip and their specific situation. And the decision that they make may uh, uh, be based on several factors like the distance or time of day or the specific activity. And we want to ensure that these options are reasonably available. Um, and we do that by making sure that adequate infrastructure exists to make each option possible. Um, so uh, for, for this perspective, for a geographer's perspective, the goal is to look at the barriers that exist to people choosing the different options uh, that work for their specific trip that they're making or decision that they're making and trying to remove these barriers as much as possible. So I see uh, the future of academia in a similar way. I think there are reasons why working in person might work, make sense for uh, some people's situations. And I think there are reasons why working online might work better for others. And I think there are reasons why a hybrid option might work best for some people. Um, so I see the goal for the future of academic work being to remove the barriers uh, for each of these options to allow people to choose the option that works best for their particular situation. Um, and if having a different, having different options available is the reason someone is able to participate in the academic world, I think we should see that as a success. Um, we know that different people have adapted to COVID in different ways, whether it's by choice or by necessity. And this is a reminder to us that people have uh, different situations that affect the decisions they make. Um, particularly in my research, uh, we look at how sociodemographic factors affect those decisions. And uh, I think it's uh, fair to say that uniform policies are not always appropriate. Um, and the, the fact that uh, virtual uh, activities have become more prominent during COVID and that this has become a more widely accepted option, I think that's given us the flexibility to think about the best approach to uh, the different aspects of our learning and the work that we do. We might decide that some courses are better taught in person or online or both. Um, we might decide that certain parts of our research are better performed in different ways. I can say for my research specifically, doing the work, uh, uh, doing all my work online is definitely doable uh, since I don't have to do any in-person data collection or observations, but I also sometimes make the decision to work in person when I can. Um, when, when that option is available to me because I find that often works better for me and how, how I'm able to do work. Um, other people might have research work that's better performed in person or they might uh, find they work better when they don't have to commute every day. Um, 
So my hope uh, is that one of the lessons we learn from COVID and geography and academics in general is to be flexible and leave different options available to people. Um, and then just the last point about the multidisciplinary nature of geography. Um, as geographers, we like, we like to uh, pride ourselves on being uh, multidisciplinary. And uh, because of that, I think we should recognize that the, the way we perform our work, even among geographers, is very different. And we should be flexible based on the different work that different people do. Um, I think it would be silly to carry on from COVID thinking that we should continue using a one-size-fits-all approach to everyone uh, within this multidisciplinary field. Uh, so the, those are just the three perspectives I thought I would offer about uh, human interconnectedness, the idea of uh, uh, choice and flexibility in academics, and the interdisciplinary nature of geography um, requiring different approaches to how research is done. And I think that's a, a good uh, justification for why we should uh, be flexible as geographers. and in general in the academic world. Okay, thank you for your thoughts, Ben. There's, there's something you said that reminded me of a post I read earlier this week by a very informed observer of higher education who was remarking on this, uh, this week somehow being the 10 year anniversary of MOOCs. Everyone's probably heard of MOOCs, massively open online courses or MOOCs which uh, back in 2011 were um, foretelling the demise of the bricks and mortar university. You might remember seven or eight years ago, there was a big debate between, I think it was Facebook and Princeton University. And they were going back and forth and one was predicting the demise of the other. I guess Princeton might've won that one, but you know, we're, we're only 10, 10 years in. So there's a, maybe that's a departure point in thinking about the the plight of MOOCs and what's happened over the last 10 years and what was supposed to happen. But uh, OK, thank you again for your thoughts. So that's that's great. Um, our third panelist is Vivian Kong, and I participated in Vivian's master's thesis defense a few weeks back. And it struck me that she could bring some really valuable insights because her work obviously is based in the Department of Geography and Environment, but she was doing research on a faraway city. And I thought, well, that would be an interesting perspective. Her entire master's was devoted to doing work on a faraway place. And in the context of experiencing COVID firsthand and doing that, I thought I would invite her in and, and get her to share her experiences as well. So Vivian, over to you. Yes, thank you so much for inviting me on. And thank you again for passing me for my exam. <laughs> so yeah, I started my master's at, at a Western in 2019 and um, just recently defended and had my thesis published like last month. So 2019, this was before COVID and I was really excited to start my master's because even before um, it officially started, I was able to work with my supervisor, Dr. Agnieszka Lijinski on one of her research projects, which involved going to various Canadian cities and collecting field research. So that got me very excited to start doing my master's. And even during us um, collecting field data, we were talking about what I could do for my own project. So it definitely got me very you know, interested in starting my project and figuring out what I actually wanted to do. So I felt like I got, got a little bit of a head start with that. And then, you know, classes started and I had a lot of fun interacting with uh, other new graduate students and new professors and learning about geography and GIS, which is what I, um, my uh, project was involved in and also learning about research in general. So then, you know, 2020, early 2020 happened and there's the whispers of COVID that it's coming into Canada and then, uh, it actually happened like, you know, lockdown and in March and then classes had to transition from in-person to um, online. And at that time I was TA as well. So the transition to TA in class online too. It was also both kind of very confusing. And then also, you know, like 
I feel kind of bad for the students too, who are even more unsure of what's happening with this transition. Now, uh, for my own research project, to be honest, I was actually pretty uh, fortunate in that I chose a project that involved data where I didn't actually have to go to um, the place. So my uh, project was based on micromobility sharing systems in Calgary, Canada, but I never actually went there, unfortunately. Um, so luckily there's just data online that I could use. But for instance, my supervisor's project, we were supposed to go to Calgary to collect field data, um, but that wasn't able to happen. And so her project, it was, it had a lot of uncertainties as to how to move forward when COVID started happening. Um, luckily, later in the year, we were able to at least collect data in Montreal. So that's good at least. But for probably a lot of master's students that needed um, to go elsewhere for field research, it must have been really difficult. And then talk about, you know, flexibility. Um, it's probably hard when you already have one idea for your project. So uh, luckily that wasn't the case for me. And um, I think I wanted to talk about the perspective of, you know, graduate students um, just starting their projects during COVID and how to manage those expectations. So a lot of times you might have um, something that you're really interested in doing research on, but with all the uncertainties with COVID, I've realized that you just have to um, really be flexible in what you can do and what's you know realistically expected um even not just for your research but like if you're doing your master's or your uh, doctorate you know writing uh takes a lot of you know effort and then you also need to manage you know your time and your routines as to finish it on time so like for instance i was hoping to uh, actually defend in august but I wasn't able to, even despite the fact that my project didn't involve or wasn't really impacted by COVID restrictions or anything. I think a lot of um, my own personal problems was related to how being in lockdown impacted me mentally and physically, you know, staying inside all the time while doing work and then not being able to have peers around to talk to. So sometimes I ask a lot, like, what could I have done differently? Um, to, you know, to have done better in this time. Uh, I can't necessarily say that I regret, you know, taking more time on my, on my thesis and defending later, but I think it's important to manage your time properly. And also very important, I think, for me was to be able to actually talk to other people. So going from being able to see my peers on a weekly basis in 2019 to staying at home and not being able to talk about each other's projects or going to one of my peers for help on you know, analyses or anything, I think um, really impacted me a lot mentally. Like, so it's kind of like, even if my own project was by myself, I realized that it's important to have, you know, conversations with peers and others. Um, to just be able to kind of like figure things out for yourself. Um, so yeah, I think for like geography as well, even if we're all doing different projects, um, I think it's you know important to be able to have everyone's perspectives when you're you know with your peers. And it's hard to do that when it was only online. Yeah, so I think that's all I have to say. Okay, thank you so much. That's a, a really important perspective. Sometimes we do lose sight of that, but of course you've gone through this experience and it can be really isolating and you've persevered. So congratulations again. <laughs> uh, much of what you said resonated with, with what Ben and Wayne had to say, and in particular Wayne's comments about uh, feeling very strongly about uh, the value of, of in-person teaching. And you've, you've underlined that really well with your experience, Vivian. So thank you for bringing that to the panel. All right, thank you.
Yeah. So, um, and our, our fourth panelist, full disclosure, is my own student. And there's a, a and obviously I'm going to let him speak for himself, but there is a really important date that will always live in my own memory. And that is Monday, March the 16th, 2020, which was my last in-person meeting. Ebenezer, I'm not sure if you remember that, but that was a, a very quiet Monday on campus. Um, and it seemed to be that everyone else got the memo about a pandemic coming except the two of us. And then of course the world essentially shut down that day or the day after, or certainly by the end of that week, uh, everything had, had ceased to be operating in any uh, normal way that as, as we knew it. So um, uh, certainly you bring that to the panel, but also we wanted to include the perspective of, of an international student. And I could think of no better student than you Ebenezer. So I'll turn it over to you for your comments. Uh, so thank you very much, Dr. Bazali, for having me on the panel. And um, I think so far we've had very interesting perspectives from the other panelists. And from what listening to everybody, Wayne, Ben, and Vivian speak, I think two main themes are coming up, which is the interconnectedness that we have as people, and also the fact that um, we need to be flexible with work and the way that the things we do. So like uh, Dr. Balizeli said, I'm uh, currently a doctoral student. Um, I completed my master's in 2020 in the middle of the pandemic. And um, at, the, at the peak of the pandemic, when the, the first lockdown actually happened, I was, before then, I was working in the Statistics Canada's RDC, which is the research data center that hosts the data set that I was using for the analysis for my master's. And the, the way the RDC works is that you need to submit your results or your output for vetting before the results are released to you. And this is because of the confidentiality of the data sets that are hosted in the RDC. So um, I was fortunate or let's say me fortunate to have the first part of my data set vetted and approved and I received it. And on that very day, I had a meeting with Dr. Bazeli to discuss the results that I had. And that was the same day that the announcement came for the lockdown. And so, that was it for me. I couldn't go into the RDC for since, since from March all the way to May. And so that actually had significant impact on, on my research. And so uh, I think one of the questions for the panel discussion that um, actually speaks to me was is whether remote research is viable and then how geography and academic work uh, would be impacted by the pandemic and finally whether we must rethink what we do and how we do it so the first thing that i observed during the pandemic was how you know a common phrase that people used to say that oh this uh, this is not we are not in the common times and the, it, it's kind of resonates to me in the sense that people were making some kind of um reference to what normal is supposed to be. And during the COVID times, um, we were trying to work hard to get back to what is so, what is normal. And um, I think you look at it in terms of the interconnectedness and the fact that we used to do things in person. And then all of a sudden, at one point in time, work, everything that moved to virtual work, and we did most of the things online in one particular space. So even the, at, at these times, it seems like we are still embracing remote work and we are being flexible with, you know, working from home and stuff like that. So in thinking about it, I look at um, higher education or academic work as a system and a system being being vulnerable to something like a pandemic and looking at how it is resilient to it in terms of getting back to its normalcy. And so must we rethink what we do and how we do it? I think yes, because if we, even if we have positives to 
the way we do things, we still need to be able to strengthen those positives so that we be able to overcome the, um, you know, how COVID hit us and we had to move into the uh, virtual world as it were. And then the other thing in terms of the interconnectedness that I want to talk about as an international student and being reflective of what actually COVID taught us is I want to look at it beyond the physical connection that we also connected socially. So it brings the issue of embracing multiculturalism in the way we do things, how we work with each other and you know, issues about equi equity, diversity and inclusion and those kind of uh, things we need to be thinking about it. I know there were instances where during the COVID there were uh, certain groups of people that were uh, being discriminated against. So it needs um, we we need we need to be rethinking the way we do things around those areas as well. And then also the impact it had on immigration. For example, I had um, a colleague who. Did, he, 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 he literally completed his um, graduate studies online in Ghana, even though he got his um, degree from Brock University here in Canada. And how the restrictions on travels and those um, kind of uh, impediment that was brought up by COVID as an international student and thinking about it now, how it affected us in the work that we did. So, in, in, in summary, I'll say that um, the, the, the COVID has taught us some lessons and we now have a blueprint that we can actually fall on in the event of um, something like this happening again in the future. And also the experience I had with my research, thankfully I, by, by the courtesy of my supervisor being Dr. Bazeli, and the School of Graduate and Postdoctoral Studies and the GAC, I was able to get that, be flexible in terms of getting an alternative to do, which I did not necessarily producing a full-fledged thesis, but I did um, a major research paper, which was accepted by the department. And, and I, it was okay enough for me to um, pass my, my master's and, uh, for, for my defense, it was a hybrid of a comprehensive exams and a defense. And these were, these were, this all falls under the flexibility aspect of um, the lessons that we can learn from COVID. So that's a summary of what I want to say. And I believe that um, you've had very um, interesting perspectives that have been brought up. So I'm hoping that I've added a few to that. Thank you. Okay, thank you so much, uh, Ebenezer, to you and again to all the panelists for sharing your thoughts and reflections, some really interesting and different and engaging points of reflection. It's a time of reflection. We've had three excellent panels, one on environment, one on indigenization, and, and this one. And this is a moment of reflection in all of those respects, as I'm sure everyone is doing, including our panelists. So we have uh, about 20 minutes left in the session and in the conference, as it turns out. So only 20 minutes to dive into any items that anyone would like to raise now that we've heard from our panelists. So um, in terms of, uh, I guess there's some spotlighting going on by the, um, the, the tech savvy people in the background. I certainly don't need to be spotlighted. I'm just facilitating things, but uh, uh, you can spotlight the panelists. And then if anyone has a question, just uh, raise your hand with the reaction button and, uh, and please go ahead. James Voot. I have a simple question to start with. So Wayne talked about hybrid and I, <laughs> I thought, wait a minute, I guess I'm not sure what we mean by hybrid necessarily. And I was so, when I was listening, I was thinking, does hybrid mean in your, when you were saying that, that you are teaching online and in person simultaneously, or does hybrid mean 
it could be a combination of both. I guess I should answer that question. So um, it means online and in person at the same time. Okay. And the reason, so the reason I ask it is because we do have a definition of a course type here at Western where hi a hybrid course is one that just has both components, but I don't think they're normally considered to be synchronous. Like they wouldn't happen at the same time. It's just that the course is offered with some components that are delivered online and some that are delivered in person. But I think everybody would be doing one or the other, not some of both. So. So if I may respond to that. Uh, yeah. That, that is certainly one option. Um, but I have heard uh, stories where people are expected to teach in the classroom and online all at the same time because you have this camera that you're addressing at the same time that you're supposed to be addressing the students. So I hope that doesn't come to fruition and I would actually personally refuse to do that. Because mm. again, as I mentioned, you're disadvantaging uh, the people who are online and the people who are in the classroom because they don't have your full attention as a professor. Mm -hmm. and, and Ben mentioned that choice and flexibility, of course, are important. So I think there should be an option. If you want to take online courses, then please take online courses. But if you want to be in the classroom, then you should be in the classroom. And I'll go back again to that story where I'm the parent of a second year university student and her and her peers are so happy to be back in the classroom because they can interact with each other, as Vivian mentioned, you know, person to person contact and being able to chat with each other is very, very important. And that's missing in an online type of environment. And we were forced into this online environment through, of course, the COVID unfortunate circumstance. And I can only reiterate that the undergrads that I know personally and who are in my courses now, I think they can hardly wait to get back into the classroom. about uh, for the other panelists any reactions to the hybrid model of teaching and learning um I, I guess one thing i i uh had on mind was uh kind of in response to uh what wayne was talking about about um the second year university uh students who uh who prefer to be uh in person and there's I, I completely agree with that. I think there's so much to gain from being in person. And uh, I was in my last year of undergrad when COVID started. And I would agree that being in person would have helped so much for the particular courses I was doing at the time. And in my particular situation, I, I, think, uh, I think everyone can probably agree that what we had to do during COVID was probably it, it was uh, very much uh, making the making the most of what we had to work with. There, there wasn't a lot we could do, and I don't think anyone would suggest that we should go back to what we were doing during COVID, uh, where everything had to be online. Plus, you had zero social interaction, even just outside of courses. I think that was the hardest part for me. Was, I mean, having courses online was one thing, and it, that took some time to adapt to but the fact that we even after we were done doing work or school at the end of the day there was really nothing else we could do and that that's that's what I I think that's what got me through in my first few years of uh, or what got me through undergrad before uh, COVID was uh, I would do my work during the day knowing that I could look forward to uh, other things in the evening and uh, meeting people and having a good time. And I think that was the hard part for me uh, was not having the, the social aspect of it more so than the online courses, which were not perfect, but they were at least somewhat manageable. So I, I think uh, when we talk about how we look uh, into the future and what we learn from COVID, I don't think we're suggesting that we should go back to what we did during COVID where everything is virtual. I think there are things to take from it where there may be situations where uh, online or virtual learning does work for certain people, but that, that wouldn't be saying that we're all 
isolated from each other and we have no social interaction at all. Um, because I, I think that was probably the hardest part of it for everyone. Okay, thank you, Ben. Uh, Vivian, did you have a, a reaction as well? Yeah, so like you were explaining the hybrid model and I was like, wait a minute, I've done that before. Before COVID, I took an anatomy class that offered in person, but then they also like streamed the lectures so that anyone who wanted to watch it online as opposed to coming in person would be able to do that. And for that course, like if someone who was watching online wanted to ask a question, they would write it in the chat and then the TA would relay it to the um, lecturer. So in the context of before COVID, I thought it was a good opportunity for, um, I guess, giving everyone like a good accessibility if they weren't able to come to uh, school that day. I was one of the people that usually came to the class because I personally liked having, uh, being in person and seeing the slides, you know, up front and interacting more. But I think that having that flexible option is um, definitely a good thing. I, but I think, so that class in particular, it was already a few years that they've established doing that. But I think for sure, if it was a class that suddenly had to scramble figuring out how to do a hybrid model like that, um, it sounds like it could be disadvantageous if, um, like for example, the uh, lecturers are unfamiliar with how to interact with both students in person and online as well. But I think that we should still consider like being able to be flexible to all students who might not be able to come to class on certain days. So I think with COVID, there's been a lot more considerations for accessibility, I think. And I think a big concern is that um, once COVID is over, all the accessibility options are gonna just kind of disappear or go away. Yeah. Thank you. Ebenezer, any thoughts on hybrid teaching and learning? Yeah, I think um, building on Vivian's point, there's certainly some advantages to a hybrid model because obviously there are students who are probably going to be doing well in an online situation versus an in-person situation. And then there will be others who will be, you know, more familiar and confident, conversant with um, working in person. So, it, it, I mean, if if I were to make any suggestion, I would say um, continuing a hybrid model where students get the opportunity to choose between coming in person for lectures or classes and those who feel like um, not, you know, those who want to choose the online model would still go for it. Because um, during, the, during, the, during the online time, we had people who even could choose between taking part in synchronous sessions versus those who wouldn't want to be part of it and they want to be have access to materials offline and still be able to do it. So I think we should have that flexibility available so that the way we teach students can also have their input into that. I, I don't I think that um, when it comes to the way teaching is done, often the focus is on how the faculty wants it to be done and not how the students want. So maybe if we get to know, for example, that um, the pro a portion of the students who would want to do an online, then hybrid should go for should be the best option. Okay, thank you for that. So I, I'm looking at the chat and I can see Kimberly has uh, made a post and um, she's made her views known about hybrid as a model and uh, that it's not a productive learning model in the Ontario context, but says she enjoys online university courses, but wonders uh, whether as online options increase, uh, will this diminish how industry values university education? That's an interesting question. Will online learning alter the reputation or impression of a university degree? Hmm, I wonder. Anyone have any thoughts 
reactions, remonstrations, demonstrations, Vivian. Yeah, so as a recently graduated master's student looking for a job, um, and also with uh, my partner who had finished his PhD in 2020 or 2019 and was looking for jobs as well. So I think maybe now, or maybe it was before too, like the university degree, I feel like is kind of like a paper, but it's more important to have the experience um, in like industries to, you know, if you were to get a job in um, the industry as well. So I think a big impact of COVID is actually finding jobs. Like for instance, when COVID uh, and lockdowns first started, there were hardly any jobs available and it was like a struggle to find something in the industry. Um, now there's, you know, I feel like there's more jobs coming up, but then they want to see certain experiences um, not necessarily a super high education. So I think that is like an important factor, not necessarily just the university degree, but all the things that you do alongside your personal projects. Thank you for that insight. Uh, it's interesting to get the experience of someone firsthand who's in the labor market, thinking about the question of how industry values or doesn't value uh, students who may have done some, some or all of their learning online. Excellent, thank you. Uh, any other questions or comments from the audience for our panelists? Ben, did you have something to add? Uh, just one quick thing to, to add, if you don't mind. Uh, first of all, Kimberly, I think that's a, a very interesting point. And uh, I liked one of the points Vivian made there it was, uh, I think we, I think the value in education should really be the experience, the experience and what the knowledge uh, that we gain from it. Um, I really think that's what we should see education as being the benefit of. So for example, what, what have I gotten out of my undergrad? What have my, I gotten out of my, uh, what have I gotten out of grad school? And uh, having the experience of uh, to co-op jobs in my undergrad and seeing a bit of uh, what the working world is like, I, what the working world is like, I I really feel like that the the importance of what we actually take out of our education is uh, kind of overlooked sometimes. I would say in favor of the fact that we have a degree. Um, I would say for, for me specifically, I, uh, I, I think online learning doesn't even, like, I, I think part of the learning process can also just be, doesn't have to be from uh, a university course. There's so much I've learned just from going online and uh, if there's something I'm interested in or want to learn, uh, finding a YouTube video or finding a blog about it uh, that I can learn as much from that as I can from a university course. And um, so to, to answer the question of how how is the industry viewed as a result of online learning, I, that's a difficult question to answer, but an interesting one. But I, I really think we should evaluate our education based on uh, the knowledge and uh, experience that we can take out of it and uh, apply to whatever we end up doing in, uh, in the future. It's interesting you say that, Ben. Uh, there's a new book out by um, Harvey Weingarten, U of T Press, and uh, I think it's called Nothing Short of Great. And one of his core arguments is we really shouldn't be uh, focusing so much on content anymore we should be focusing on the learning process and so degrees and credentials should reflect what people are able to do and not much more than than what they know um, and uh, I think one of the places where this kind of question is going to have to be resolved 
uh, by universities and other institutions is in experiential learning because experiential is supposed to impart some of the things that Vivian and, and, and actually all of you have touched on uh, in terms of the value of being in a place and, and learning the kinds of experiences of working with people in a professional kind of context. So this is all going back to Kimberly's uh, original question. And of course, there is a lot of pressure to go online because it seems to be the new uh, model and it seems to be the future, future, at least in some people's eyes. So I'm not sure what's going to happen to the experiential learning model as uh, it faces this pressure seemingly heading in the opposite direction to do a lot, uh, a lot more online. So time will tell, I guess. Um, any, any final questions or comments or thoughts, Wayne? Well, first of all, I 100% agree with what uh, Ben said. And since you brought up the topic of experiential learning, one of the whole problems with an online course is if you want to do a field trip, for example, a field trip to an international destination, you can't do that online. And I 100% agree that you learn a lot through experiential learning with being in different environments and going through the learning process. So experiential learning is key. And as geographers, we have to always embrace experiential learning. Very well put. And I think probably everyone online right now can probably endorse and get behind that comment. So thank you for that. So ladies and gentlemen, it is 4.58. And as I mentioned off the top, this is the last, but certainly not the least session of CAGONT 2021. Ours is a necessary rear guard action. We are still living the pandemic and we thank you for uh, your thoughts and reflections on what this experience means and unfortunately what it might continue to mean in the months ahead, but hopefully not for too much longer. So I want to thank the panelists and everyone online for this engaging discussion. And uh, you've helped us to round out what is, from my perspective, despite, if you agree, despite it being online, a really excellent conference. So thanks to you and thanks to the conference organizers for a superb CAG on to 2021. The Chair of Geography and Environment is online and applauding. Jamie, I don't want to put you on the spot, but do you have anything to say as a final word on CAG on? Oh, yeah, thanks. Um, I'd like to say thanks to everybody for participating. Thank you, Michael, for organizing this panel. Uh, Wayne was much too modest in his own presentation. He's also the most recent uh, winner of the Ontario, what is it, Service to Ontario uh, Geography Award. Well deserved for all of that CAG on. So congratulations. You didn't include that, so I've put him on the spot. Um, yeah, I mean, we did wish that Kagon could be in person, but here we are. Um, thanks for everybody on making it a good experience. And I enjoyed the panels. I, I thought it was fun. I really like panels. Uh, we learned that feed loop, <laughs> feed loop isn't quite as good for panels, but there you go. <laughs> it's part of the learning, right? So yeah, thanks everybody. And um, next year we think it'll probably be at Laurier, but stay tuned, I guess. So. All right. Thanks again. Thanks. Take care. Bye for now. Bye.